Well, good day to you all, brethren. <laughs> Here we are again. Uh, it's been quite a magic carpet ride. <laughs> I was supposed to have two days vacation and the warfare that hit me was phenomenal. <laughs> But here I am sitting here, and it appears that I'm fully restored. I was, I was really ill. I was seriously, seriously ill. What was wrong with me? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, because uh, I didn't go to the doctor and get diagnosed, and I, I don't know. But I'm okay today, and I have a word uh, for the powers that rule this world. I have a word from the word for the powers that rule this world. You are too late. <laughs> the vine that entered into this world that was planted in my soul has gone forth and rooted in enough other people that if you should succeed in killing me, which I don't think is possible, he has other choices that he will rise right up in. It is too late. <laughs> You're too late. You're too late. In Jesus' name. So, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, when Jehovah restored righteous creation, when he restored righteous Adam in the person of Noah, Shem, and Japheth, that restoration was uh, was interrupted with, well, let me say it another way. What do you mean he restored righteous Adam? What, what happened to Adam? Let me, let me say it. Lord, this is your message. It's your venue. It's your voice. It's your body. It's your everything. <laughs> I want to give you all the glory healing me and uh, to thank all of the people who pray for me and uh, to thank you for the honor of preaching this incredible message which is an introduction to the the next age which is already manifesting before this present age has ended we have about 200 some odd years to go of this age and some of us that are alive today will survive the next 200 or so years to fully enter into the next age, which is the age that is the Sabbath rest, the seventh 1,000 year day. So the, the, the issue is, Lord, help me to make this incredible message simple. <laughs> Because that's your whole goal, to make the, the truth simple. And the truth is incredible and hard to believe. But this is the truth. That we, we as we understand ourselves, we as we see ourselves, we, we are just a part of Adam. We are not the whole man. Where that outer shell, the image, the part of Adam that shows, and inside of us, in the form of mind, in the form of mind, lies the entire creation and the source of the creation. I, I had a problem with that for years. All of that infinity was inside of me. I'm thinking inside of my body. You know, the infinity that's inside of me is spiritual. It's in my mind. See? The body is just a garment that hangs on infinite worlds. And the infinite worlds are power. The power for consciousness, the power for existence. The power that energizes our bodies, the power source for everything that we can recognize and comprehend is inside of us in the form of a mind. It's not inside my body. Yes, I struggled with that. I couldn't understand it. 
It's not inside my body, it's inside my mind. And my mind is not a is not an organic organ. It's 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 spirit, it's energy. It's inside of me and it's outside of me. It flows through me. It's the energy that animates this whole world and all of the beings in it. It's all energy. And when that energy is inside of a human being, it's called mind. Well, even that's not accurate. I mean, how do I make this simple? The simple energy that flows through everything is soul. The soul. And that energy is in the animals and the trees. And of course, that's pantheism. It's in everything. But there is a, another source of energy, a higher source of energy, a source higher than soul, which is likened unto water. That is like in, that is called spirit. That's the that, what is what is spirit? Who knows what it is? It's a name that's been applied to it so that so that we can possibly grasp some comprehension of who we are. And the reason we need to know who we are is so that we can work with God to become all that he intends us to be. Because we are participants with him in the creation. He doesn't want us to be tenants in his house. He wants us to share his house, to be a partner with him. Isn't that ridiculous? To be a partner with God, the creator of everything. Well, it may be ridiculous to us because our mind is rooted and grounded in pride. But it's not ridiculous to the creator who desires a fellowship, who desires a prosperous and a positive relationship with us. He wants a relationship that is in exchange with us. He has much, much to offer us, and we would not exist without him. But he wants what we have to offer him. That's why he created us. See? The first time I read that, that the purpose for the creation is that God wants fellowship with us, I thought that was so bizarre and arrogant. You know? But it's not, you see. Because we cannot comprehend the creator who can comprehend God. You know? that a being that has all power, a being that has all power, is lacking something. And what he's lacking is a mirror, some conscious thinking living being that will reflect back to himself who he is. He wants to talk to himself. I thought that was so crazy the first time I read that. But it seems to be true. It seems to be true. So, I have watched Star Trek. I watched every Star Trek episode of uh, the original Star Trek and, and the, the second generation. And all of these, brethren, the, the children of the world know all of this. Only the God's people don't know these spiritual secrets. Okay. I, I, I'm just going to have to chat with you until the Lord arrives because all I have so many thoughts that are dovetailing in my mind. I just don't know how, how to get it all out. You know? So many thoughts that he gave me this morning. Everything's in there in a big lump. See, I understand it. But when it comes to my mouth, it, it hits a bottom there. I can, I can comprehend a lot more than I can speak out in explanatory terms. So which thought, wait, where, where does he want me to go? I'm, I'm almost in standstill right now, so just hang on with me, okay? Let me try to, to follow that thought, that train of thought. The scripture says the children in this world are much wiser than God's children. But we have the potential to be wiser than them. If we will just submit ourselves to God. The problem is that the problem is that before time began, when there was no time, 
Adam, the creation that God made to be a mirror that, that would talk back to him. You see? Right now I'm thinking about the fairy tale of the, who is it? Snow White or the wind? Well, anyway, fairy tales mixed up. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? What fairy tales? Snow White. Snow White. It's a, it's a wicked rendition of a spiritual truth. We are God's mirror. And that, well, with my body, even my body, well, my body can say it's an image, but my personality, my character is, is his image. He is the one he wants to talk to. And he's calling to us continuously. And the wall that we're hanging on is the wall of salvation. The mirror is hanging on the wall of salvation. But we're on the other side of the mirror, see? We're supposed to be saying mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? And the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ is the fairest of them all. He is the first human being that is fully in the image and likeness of God. And we are his brethren because he, part, part of him, part of him was at one time what we call human. And the, the fund, of course, he's not human anymore, okay? He's not human anymore, brethren. He's not homo sapien anymore. His, that part of him was swallowed up into the, into the whole creation, into the whole man which is a much greater being than we can even comprehend by talking to each other down here. We begin to comprehend him by talking vertically, excuse me, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We understand this much, brethren, this much, you see. So, so Jesus is the fairest of them all. He's the one, the first one, that completed uh, the process, listen, of the salvation of his soul. His body was not preserved. I'm in 10 different directions, Lord. Please have your way. Jesus' body was not preserved. Today, Jesus is the name of God. His same personality has been joined to, integrated with the spiritual substance, the spiritual essence, the spiritual energy that we know as the Son of God to the degree that we can comprehend it. It's a formation of God's power. There is only one God, and his ability is beyond our comprehension. So the scripture tells us we must become like little children and and begin to learn things about the spiritual life. That may sound unreal or impossible or bizarre to us or frighten us. Why must we begin to learn? Because there is a changing of the ages. There's a crossing over of this present age, which is the sixth 1,000 year day, okay? and the next seventh 1,000 year day. Astrologies, astrologists will tell you we're on the cusp. They're overlapping. And many of us here today, the souls of many people today. Uh, could you turn that up, please? One minute, one minute. The souls of many people who are alive today in the physical world, whose body is alive today, are going to experience a change that will uh, that will bring along the, that will increase the potential age of their physical body, because the next age or the age to come that's already here is an age of the return to the giants. Now, will there be physical giants again? I don't know. But gigantic souls or very large souls or enlarged souls or very powerful souls produced 
giants, whatever they look like. Now, we know what the giants uh, that appear after the flood look like. I, I believe they were humanoid. I cannot call them homo sapien, but I believe they were humanoid. But that doesn't mean that they look like that on the other side of the flood. So, I now have started 10 different messages. It's now started 10 different messages. So, to get back to, to Noah, One of the words in my heart this morning, as I was driving over here, was uh, had to do with the Book of Enoch. I've read the Book of Enoch a couple of times. There are parts of it that I don't understand. I don't like to read what I don't understand unless the Lord has specifically led me to it, which means he intends to explain it to me. I've told you this. I don't read parables because then you understand them with your car mind and they become heresy. They, they, they become strongholds in your mind when the Spirit of God comes to try to tell you the truth of the parable. You cleave to the, to the parable like it's God's truth. The, the, the fallen soul, okay? Our personality is fallen. What does fallen mean? It means it's separated from the wisdom of God. So when we believe the parable, that that parable is truth, when the Lord comes to us with the spiritual truth, our fallen soul fights to almost to the point of death, fights with everything it has, thinking it's being faithful to God. See, so I don't read parables unless the Lord directs me to it. The one thing that the Lord brought to my memory from the book of Enoch this morning is the sons of the giants. Now you have to hear this, not the giants, the sons of the giants. Well, who are the sons of the giants? Are there any daughters of the giants? I don't read anything about the daughters of the giants. How were they born? Were they born from human women and then they got big? I actually asked that question in their message. How were they born? Who were their mothers? Uh, who were the sons of the giants? In the book of Enoch, they're threatened with death. And they're all very upset. So they go to Enoch. Did I just say the book of Enoch? Because there's a book of giants and there's several books of Enoch. So they went to Enoch, the prophet of the day, the known prophet of the day. To intercede on their behalf, to ask God, could they not, but for their lives, they they understand that God has pronounced a death sentence on them. Now, I never understood why they were going to die. Why did they have to die? I understand that that their behavior was unacceptable. I read that they they ate they, they, they were stripping the planet if it if where they lived on the other side of the flood is considered a planet, I don't know. They ate up all the vegetation so that the animals that were vegetarians had nothing to eat. Then they ate all the animals and they were I don't know that it's actually in the book of Enoch, but the implication was they were starting to eat humans. Does that sound very strange to you? Well, that's being advertised today. I have to be very careful. We, we, we've been getting too many strikes here. And I'm not sure how acceptable it is to say that one can eat what one should never eat. Okay? If you get what I'm saying. I really wouldn't want to lose this channel. We have hundreds of videos on this channel. We do have backups, but it would be a horrendous job putting them together. They're not YouTube backups there. Mm -hmm. Can't put it backups. 
Maybe we should start downloading all of the YouTube. Maybe we'll start that one a day, one a week, but let's, let's start doing that, okay? We'll find out if there's a way to back up the whole channel. Could you do a little research, please, and find out if there's just a way to back up the whole channel? Thank you. And that, that's the implication. They were going to start eating uh, other, other, other conscious, other sentient, they say sentient species, feeling species that can communicate. So I knew they were, they were behaving badly. But I don't honestly know that I actually put two and two together that that was the reason that they had to die. If I did, I don't remember. You see, the way the Lord teaches me is that he, he teaches me whatever he's teaching me that day, that week, that month. And then he goes on to the next teaching. And at some point in the future, either I put, either I connect the dots or he helps me to connect the dots. But if the dots, or before, I won't say if, before the dots are connected in my mind, sometimes I forget what he told me. He had a lot of things that he told me. You know. It's interesting because this, the New Testament says the Holy Spirit will bring to mind uh, everything you've ever been taught. So it says something like that. And I've always wondered what that meant. <laughs> now I understand. I've been taught so many. I've forgotten so much. I listen to my old messages and I say, well, isn't that interesting? I don't remember teaching that. But it's, it's much easier for me to comprehend the spiritual truth that the Lord is reminding me of that he has already taught me, that I have already learned, that I have already preached to you. Okay? And for him to start teaching me today a spiritual principle that he wants to connect to what he taught me yesterday. So I don't remember ever connecting that dot, that they were sentenced to death because they were destroying the planet or that they were in danger of starting to even consume each other, or, or that they were starting to eat sentient life on the planet, if it was a planet. If the, other, if the world on the other side of the flood was on a planet. So the Lord spoke to me this morning. I, I, let me tell you this. Something has happened to me. He has increased. He has, he has taken a giant step of increase in me. And I was acknowledging that as I drove over here today. He is so much more powerful than me. The signs of it, the invisible signs of it, what that I'm getting revelation every day, it just flows into my mind with no apparent, not me asking a question, it's just, just flowing into me out of a clear blue sky. Revelation, knowledge of the Old Testament, the New Testament this morning of the Book of Enoch, uh, just an incredible understanding just flowing into my mind in every area, not just spiritual, in every, every human area of human relationships in the scripture. But everything just just incredible wisdom is just flowing into me. And the outward sign of it that I, the outward sign of it is that you see I have a personal ministry that is reflected in this ministry that you say. So when I say my ministry, I mean my personal experience is changing. I and we, when I say we, it means the whole ministry. I have a ministry that's just me, and I have a ministry that's all of us. And then all of us have a ministry that goes to the world. Okay. Uh, we've been isolated here for so long. Okay? Now, years ago, when we had Years ago, when there were, it was a different group in New York. A lot, the brethren that are that are in in Africa, and and England and other states, they've been around for like 30, 30. The oldest one is here since nineteen eighty eight. Okay, people have been here a long time. But in New York, the groups keep changing in New York. So the people that are here in New York right now, as far as they know. This has been almost a sedentary ministry. We just study and teach and study and teach. Previous groups we did a lot of traveling with, okay? Even before we went to conferences with the brethren from Minnesota, okay? We, we traveled overseas. We were in England, we were in France. 
we were in Nigeria five times, okay, in Nigeria, um, to, to other, uh, other places, even in New York, to other ministries in, in New York, upstate New York, uh, South Carolina, Colorado. There was activity, okay? even if it was a local fellowship. We, we were doing things, we were going out, and, and we were God's eyes and ears and analyzing things, and it was really exciting. But somehow this last 15 years, I think, we had 15 years, right? 15 years, right? More. Well, at least I lose track of time, at least the last 10 years. All of that seems to, well, when well, we were going on conferences as recently as three or four years ago, we were going on conferences there. Yeah. So then it's the last three or four years that we just just study and teach and study and teach with no, no field work, you know. And it was sort of boring, you know. The message is exciting, but we have other sides of our personality that need to be satisfied. And, but that's what it was. I, I would express it as saying, I'm in this continent here in New York. And that's all changing. Everything seems to have opened up. There was a tent revival, what seems to have attached us to a local fellowship and moved two of the anointed members into my, into, if it's into my life, it's into, he's there into your life. He's changed over the, the company that cleans my home to someone from, very anointed woman from this church. A handyman from time to time, I need a handyman to do work in the house. A very anointed handyman from that church. He's established a relationship with the pastor between me and he. And um, so, so, so there's an outward movement, there's movement, there's movement, <laughs> okay. And uh, when I fell ill this time, what was wrong with me? I don't know what was wrong with me. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you what was wrong with me, okay. It started out as an inflammation in my lungs, which I get once or twice a year, okay. And then when the prednisone cleared that up, there was something very wrong with me, and I don't know what it was. I honestly don't know. So. At one point, when I, I was still sick after a week, it's way too long to be sick, I said, what is there anything else I can do? He had me call a uh, text for prayer, the pastor of this church that he's just attached us to, and several other pastors that that received me. I don't know that they, had, they never comment on my books, okay? Could you turn that? Did I say up? I meant down. Did I yeah. tell you to turn it up? You said up, but I knew you meant down. So, <laughs> one more? Down. One more down. So I called several pastors who all responded, and one of them who was a name, a known name that somehow God has given me a relationship with, actually called back twice to see how I was doing. That's phenomenal. You mean, I don't know whether you can understand that or not, but that's absolutely phenomenal considering the isolation we've experienced here because of the, if not the rejection of the message, the lack of understanding of it. People, they're afraid of it. They're, they're men of God, but they're afraid of it. It's so different, they're afraid of it. See? But they've received my person. They've received the anointing on me. And this, if you can hear what I'm saying, was phenomenal that they all prayed for me. And this morning, I seem to be wrong. That was yesterday. I called them all yesterday morning. And I seem to be wrong. I'll know for sure that I'm fully healed when I can walk my two miles a day again. But right now, sitting here, I feel wrong. So there's been an expansion of human relationship here. I don't know how far it's going to go. I don't know what it means other than that Christ in me has taken a big, a big step forward. And what's coming next? I don't know. So um, why did I start to tell you that? I, I was talking about the giants. So I don't know how I got into that. I, I don't know how I got to that. But one of the things he just that just flowed into me goes, uh, one of the things that just flowed into my mind this morning when I was asking him what I should preach, because I, I was in a crisis, Reverend. I was really sick. <laughs> yeah. So. This last week, and I wasn't preaching, I was like, in my mind, I was cut off from everything 
that I preached before I supposedly went on vacation. Okay, this was my vacation. I had no connection to previous messages, you know. So I was just asking, what do you want me to preach? And I had the word of knowledge for the powers of this world that it's too late. They can't kill me, but if they could kill me, it's too late because the vine that's in me has already spread to too many other people. If you kill me, you'll just show up on someone else. Well, you say that already happened since Jesus was resurrected. Not true, brethren. What was delivered to the church on Pentecost was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit. It's not a plant. It's not the vine. See? Oh, God, help me to stay on talking. I, I created a teaching and posted it to, I posted it to the Telegram groups. I posted it to the Forbes News. I don't know if it's anywhere else. In which I talk about Jesus prophesying what's happening now. The plant coming forth. First the blade, then the ear, then the ear, the full ear in the corn. Three stages of appearing of the plant. All three stages separate than the appearing of the spirit. The spirit's not a vine. The plant is a vine. So the plant is here. And it's it's disseminated. It travels and puts down roots through the preaching of the word when the vine preaches the word. We've been preaching here for 35 years. And this vine has planted and rooted itself in enough people that if the powers of this world could kill me, which they can't. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. So, anyway, I, you know, when I have a day like this, if I, in my own mind right now, this message is so disjointed, but when I listen to it, I'm going to find that it will soon, it will follow it in order we came together somehow. So I'm back to the, the giants. Why were they being killed? Why was God killing them? And Enoch goes to speak to the to God and comes back and says, There's nothing that could be done. You have to die. And they were moaning and groaning and terrorized. Terrorized and upset. All the sons of the giants. Nothing about daughters. And nothing about the giants. Just the sons of the giants. Well, today I understand why they have to die. And when it comes out of my mouth, that's what I'm hoping to tell you. Why they have to die. The reason they have to die is the same reason that the creation of God died after. God raised it up again in Noah. All of Ham's descendants, Shem's descendants, and Jesus' descendants spiritually died. For the same reason that the giants died. And the reason that they died, and the reason that we, the reason that our bodies die today, our bodies dry today, is because they are not connected to the source, to the power source that will sustain them. In, in its pristine state, and I don't know what we would look like when we have a body in its pristine state, and there's no example yet because we haven't seen Jesus' body yet. We have not seen the permanent body that will house Jesus, the name of God. We are his body, but we're not alive yet. We're a corrupt form of a body that we, our own body kills him. Does that sound 
crazy to, did you ever hear of an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself? We attack him, our own body, our own, the, the, the mind of the body. But then this body is an animal. The mind of the animal attacks the giver of life when he enters into us in a seed form. Attacks the seed that it shouldn't grow in the ground. Makes no sense. We're self-destructive. So we don't know what Jesus' body looks like because it hasn't come into existence yet. And we are his body, so we don't know what we're going to be. And Paul said that. We don't know what we're going to be. That's what Paul said. We don't know. But when we see him, we'll be as he is. But that's talking about soul. Just say a prayer for me that I stay on target here. Please. So the reason they had to die was that they were cut off from the, the source of creation. And they were starving to death. Why were they, why did they consume all the plants? Why did they kill all the animals? Why were they starting to attack sentient species? Because they were starving to death. They were giants, very possibly physical giants. And their bodies required a lot of food. But they were cut off from the source of spiritual food. That sustains life. They were cut off from the source of spiritual food, and they were destroying the environment that Jehovah gave them to live in because they were starving to death. And there were enough of them that were big enough so that the future of the whole planet, if it was a planet at that time, was going to be just, or at least the beings on the planet, would have been completely wiped out. And then they would have died anyway. Because they would have, well, they would have turned on each other. I just had an interesting thought. One of the TV series that I used to watch when I used to watch uh, spiritual movies from the other side, as I've told you many times, once I found the Zohar, that was the end of that. The Highlander, they can be the only one. They were all consuming each other, cutting off each other's heads, acquiring their energy, and so there would be just one man left on the earth. And then he would have died anyway, he would have dropped to death. That's why they had to die. They did it to themselves. See, our, our corrupt mind blames God for everything. The scripture says, seeing they won't see, hearing they won't hear. Well, why would God do that to somebody, I asked. Well, no, they did it to themselves. Seeing they won't see, hearing they won't hear, that they should be converted and be saved. He says, why does God want them to be converted? He does. Okay? But the mind of the flesh doesn't want them to be converted. And they're in submission to the mind of the flesh. <laughs> you see, God wants only good for us. All the bad things come from our own mind. Everything evil in this world is an emanation of the mind of Homo sapien. Satan is a spiritual aspect of Homo sapien. Humanity. We are the beast. The scripture is clear. But the church has eyes that won't see and ears that won't hear. See? And God formed the animals out of the ground. This body is an animal formed out of the ground. Our soul is formed out of the dust of the ground. We're a many-faceted creature. But many of us, even Christians, live only out of that most outer layer. Why? Because 
Seeing we refuse to see, and hearing we refuse to hear. So where do we go from here? Anyway? With this story, the greatest story ever told. So, brethren, the creator of the creation. The name of the creation is Adam. And Adam is a spiritual man. We are the body. See, if you look at the book of Genesis, God put Adam in the garden twice. And each time he put him in the garden, the English word put is a translation of a different Hebrew word. He put him in the garden in two different ways. I want to suggest to you that the two Adams that were put in the garden were male and female because the scripture says he made them male and female. And the male and female aspects of the man, Adam, were two. There were two. The man is mankind. The man is mankind. And he is male and female, spiritually male and female, not his body. His body is the female man. This body and the personality that's attached to it that grows out of the blood is the female Adam, called the first Adam, made from the earth. We were formed out of the ground. Around this earth was water, and the water is the soul. See, the moisture that came from Jehovah's breath became ground, and he made us the female soil of the creation, the female soil of Adam. And the male soil of Adam is invisible, he's inside of us, and his name is Abel. And our, our family name is Cain. Well, Sheila, what do you say? The point was murderous. Yes, we killed our husband and we died. And here we are, dying. We shall die. And the way to live, uh, to live again is to reconcile with our husband and submit to his authority. See? Well, he's dead. We killed him. But he rose again. Abel, our husband rose again in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. It was Abel who rose from the dead in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth being a, an expression of being a unique personality. Don't shut off the message. Okay? Jesus of Nazareth, a unique personality of a class of personalities called Cain. Jesus of Nazareth, a unique personality, nothing, no one else like him before or after, like our fingerprints, right? No one else like him before or after, a unique personality, but one of a class of personalities, or soul, souls, the generic name of which is Cain. The first Adam made from the earth, earth, that's who we are. And we have no means of communication with the source of life. Why? Because that's how Jehovah made us. Well, I don't like how Jehovah made us. Well, then you're dead. You live for a few years and you die. This body and the personality that is attached to it, no, you're not going to have it, no. You're not going to meet all your friends and mothers and fathers. No, it's a lie. You've been fed a lie. Who's lying to you? The powers and principalities that are living through you. The female, the female uh, side of the woman. Because it's a great mystery. Cain is male and female. And Abel is male and female. So Cain... The female soil of the creation has produced a form, a form of manhood that produces 
the life of this dimension, which is not which is not true life, but it's the life, it's the temporary life of this dimension for a short season, a few years, and then it dies. And they have not been able to to uh, provide a permanent form. I mean, this spiritual side of Cain. Cain is male and female. She has a spirit. This body has its own spiritual side. Cannot keep us alive. It has to keep being born again. It has to keep making new bodies and new personalities that it can live through. And our husband is dead because there's no existence on this, even on this level, without him because he is imbued with the breath of life. See? And Jehovah formed the man, okay? Jehovah formed mankind and breathed the breath of life into the dust. He formed mankind, okay, a spiritual formation, and breathed into the dust. So there's mankind and there's dust. Two different words. He formed the man, and this is how he did it. He began by breathing the breath of life into the dust. And into the ground. He didn't breathe the breath of life into the ground. He breathed it into the dust. And the name of the entity that came into existence uh, that was dust, spiritual dust, imbued with Jehovah's breath. It's a personal name so that we, with our little pea brains, might possibly just get a clue as to what the Lord is trying to tell us so that he can save our lives. His name is Abel. See? And he's the husband and the life of the animal that was formed from the ground. And the two of us together, Cain and Abel, and really should be Abel and Cain, it just says Cain first in our fallen state, but the two of us together, Abel and Cain, imbued with the breath of Jehovah are called mankind. And if we're missing the dust, we're not mankind. If we're missing the ground, we're not mankind. If we're missing the breath, which is both soul and spirit, we're not mankind. We're a part of mankind. And only the whole man has the, the mechanism which can receive uh, the life of God and disperse it to the rest of the creation. If the parts are not in the right order, the, the life does not go, it's not dispersed throughout the whole creature. And we die spiritually. And when we die spiritually, eventually our body dies. Everybody dies. Everybody born of a woman dies in this age. See, ever since, ever since the the uh, Cain, okay, the animal, okay, the the physical. I mean, who knows what we were on the other side of the flood? Overthrew, overthrew our husband Abel. We're born in this form that endures for a season and dies. Usually after at least some suffering, if not much suffering, depending on depending on the sowing and reaping judgment, listen, that is affecting and influencing the higher consciousness that has brought you into existence. We are getting there is a higher consciousness. Okay? The female side of the creation okay? that captured Abel, the breath, 
brought into existence our, our male side, the male side of us, the male side of Cain. Captured Cain's breath, captured his authority, and brought us into existence with a higher soul. And it's a higher soul that doesn't die. Why? Because the breath of Jehovah cannot die. It's, it's some form of the animal, some form of the, the because both Cain and Abel come the, the foundational element that they're made, there are two foundational elements that they're made from, and that's Jehovah's breath, which is soul and spirit. Breath has moisture in it, see? Jehovah's breath is soul and spirit, and then the other element is earth. So even the animal that was made from the ground has some form of spirit in it. And we did a whole series uh, on how the earth came into existence how substance came into existence. Initially, there was snow in the water. This is the teaching of the Zohar. Well, Sheila, don't you know that's an occult book, says the Christian. Don't you know that the Zohar has been debunked, says someone like Doreen. Uh, you don't understand it correctly, says the Jew, who was an expert in the Zohar. I'm telling you what the Lord told me. Now, are you going to have idolatry for authority? Or are you going to submit to the authority of Christ who's inside of you if he's inside of you? And this message is to people that have Christ inside of them. We wouldn't even be listening to you. Or if something in you was, if that spirit in you was attracting you to me, he will be inside of you because he's a vine. That's spreading out through this word and ruining down in everyone that believes what they hear. So I just lost my place. What was I talking about? I was talking about Cain having a male side to her. And the male side of Cain is the is is the soul, which is which is a part of Jehovah's breath. The soul went to, to the animal, to Cain, and the spirit of Jehovah's breath went to Abel. They cannot be separated. Cain and Abel cannot be separated. The male and female side of Adam cannot be separated. I've just given them personal names. What I'm telling you is very scriptural, and he made them male and female. One is primarily soul, the other is primarily spirit, and they, together, they're Jehovah's breath imbued into the earth, they cannot be separated. Everything is just the moral, the moral order in which they relate to each other. It's a great mystery. But Cain is us. This is the form that we're in today. And Abel is Jesus. That's the form that he's in today. Actually, more accurately, Abel is Christ today. Is invisible. Abel is still. If you if you have consciousness, if you, if you have consciousness in this world, if you're alive by the standards of this world, Abel in you is dead, buried under under Cain. The resurrection of Abel is the death of Cain in her present form. The resurrection of Abel is the death of Cain in her present form. Now, a miracle is available to us. A king can die. A able can be resurrected and king can die without our body dying. This is a miracle that comes from God by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's mercy to us. So don't anyone say that I'm talking about physically dying right now because I am not. So the the, the spiritual aspect of Cain that's supposed to be in submission to the spiritual aspect in Abel, functioning as one whole in agreement, divided. The soul separated from the spirit. Well, that, that sounds familiar. 
in the Bodhi rooms, we, we finally have to separate our soul from spirit. Well, that's because when, before, at the time of the fall, the soul separated from the spirit and realigned in a, in a, in a wrong moral order. It was, it, my carnal way of expressing it is the spirit was atop of the soul and the spirit was in union with the spirit of God who provided life evermore, see? But the soul separated from the spirit because the soul wanted to be equal to the spirit. And then after she was equal to the spirit, she got on top of the spirit. When she got on top of the spirit, the connection between God and the spirit broke. She, she killed the source of life and then she found out that even though she was in his position, the, the spirit of life would not flow into her. You see? And here we are today, seeing but refusing to see, and hearing but refusing to hear. Why? Because it means we must die to everything that we are in this world and let our souls separate from our spirit and the spirit return to authority over the soul, which means we're no longer in charge of our own life. It means we'll be a married woman, whether you're a physical male or a physical female, and your body does not belong to you anymore. And your will does not belong to you anymore, and your plans for the future do not belong to you anymore. You are married now. You have become a new creature. You're no longer alone. You're a family. And you're under authority. And you're in submission to your husband. God, Christ, and the woman. God, Christ, the man, and the woman. So hearing we don't hear, and seeing we don't see. Why am I saying, oh my God, I just had a flash. I just had a flash of someone that I know. They had a big idol, that's a big idol in his life. He's compromised his soul to preserve that idol. And he will surely lose it. What a crash coming. What a crash coming. So, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Yes, the ages, were, the ages are overlapping. And the age that's coming is a return to the age of the giants. Now, God never does anything twice. He never does anything the same way. So will we become physically large? My guess is probably not. But who knows? But probably not. Why do I say probably not? Because, and maybe this is going on, my understanding is that God wants to use what he has. So the, the substance that formed the bodies of the giants <sighs> um, was was changed. The DNA was changed when when Noah, when the power of God. We don't, brother. We don't know what Ham looked like, what Shem Ham and Japheth looked like. We don't know what they look like. I think we have reason to believe that Ham was the only one that was actually in a a physical form, if it was a human form, I don't know. You see? You see? The flood didn't kill everything on the earth. It could not possibly have killed everything on the earth. The scripture is, when the scripture says everything in the earth died, it's talking about this earth. You see? And the scripture is basically talking about the life of God in the earth. 
see the garden, the garden that God put Adam in was this whole world. The garden was an environment that God created for the creation. And it was this whole world. But this whole world is clay. When God put Adam in the garden and he said, here's the garden, you keep it. And that word keep means to guard it. What guard means, brethren, what that really meant is that Adam, this garden is going to be whatever you want it to be. Because your mind is going to form this garden. When the scripture says that God put everything in it that Adam could want. You know, Adam was a supernatural creature who could, who could cause anything he wanted to materialize. It was a supernatural garden if he wanted an apple, an apple tree sprung up, if that's how it worked. I don't know how it worked. I don't, I don't believe at that point it was a physical body that digested and, and bit into physical food. So let's stay with the spiritual principles. Adam was created with the ability, with the supernatural ability to manifest whatever he wanted. I don't believe that he had a body, an animal body yet. Although the animal was the animals were formed on the morning of the sixth day, and Adam was formed in the afternoon or the evening of the sixth day. But I believe that they were two separate races. Just so that we can, and I, I, I don't know any more than I'm telling you, okay? So, just so that you can follow me, the, uh, the, the, the two atoms came into existence on the same day. The animals, which let's call them homo sapiens, I don't think they're homo sapiens, but physical beings like us, you know. See, even, even in the book of Gilgamesh, and the way I so, so said something to me about Gilgamesh coming over here. You know? Not necessarily about Gilgamesh, but please help me get back to Gilgamesh if I get lost here. Uh, if, you, if you are in, in, in the mind of God, if you are, if you're motive, brother, everything is motive. If you sincerely desire knowledge and wisdom, so that God could be glorified in you. If your motives are pure, that you want God, that you want to be an honorable person, that you want truth, uh, you can extract truth from any source without being harmed. You can go to Gilgamesh, you can go to the uh, Indian Gospels, uh, you can go to to any occult gospel other than Satanism, any spiritual teachings that are an honest quest for truth, which of which there are many. And you can feed there and be blessed by it. Well, wh why would you want to do that? Because, brethren, the Bible, which is the book that has words written in it, is merely an abbreviation, a, a, a doorway, a, a doorway through which you can contact the spirit of, of, of the, the creator. It's a doorway. The Bible is a doorway. All truth is in the spirit of the creator. I mean, the, the, I, mean I, I read the Bible. I thank God for the Bible. I, I'm so carnal that I still need it. Okay, does that mean the day will come that I don't need the Bible? No, it means the day will come that the whole Bible, every last word of it will be in my mind and in my heart and I won't need a written book. That is the word of God. Spiritual truth is infinite. Our mind cannot contain that, not even a fraction of it, not even a hair of it. So, Spiritual truth is dispersed throughout humanity. There are brethren, Jesus is only glorified for 2,000 and some odd years. Spiritual truth has always been in the earth. Why? Because Jehovah's breath 
is in the earth. So men, you know, Homo sapiens have been seeking spiritual truth for thousands of years. And they've been writing it down. And they've been understanding it in the best way that they can. I actually read somewhere, that it's somebody's opinion, somewhere that, um, uh, not Aristotle. What's Aristotle's students name? Begins with an S. Socrates? Socrates, Socrates. 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 It was Aristotle's student, was it? That's why I have the backwards. <laughs> it was it was Socrates again. That Socrates had such a desire for the truth, and he actually contacted in a spiritual way the soul of Messiah. That spiritual life that Jesus of Nazareth was joined to. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the personality of Jesus of Nazareth, was joined to a spiritual being that we call the soul of Messiah, who was he? He's a mortal Adam, his thin string of light that entered into the empty space. The, the problem was that he couldn't just he couldn't pass it on. Socrates couldn't pass it on. And there have been men, usually men, but maybe women too. Men is a generic term for me. Don't, don't be women slimmer with me, please. Talking about people. They have been seeking spiritual truth for thousands of years. See? And they've written it down and they've received a lot of spiritual truth, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere because it, 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 it enters into this world in a form that enlightens the, the 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 individual person, but it has no power to to reproduce to to to, uh, to uh, reproduce itself, or, or it has no power to rebuild the relationship between God and humanity. We're lost, rather we're lost in the female side of the creation. We're lost in the female side of the creation. There's a wall, a big gulf between us and the male side of the creation that we cannot cross. So information gets through because the Lord's been trying to talk to us ever since the fall. He's continuously talking to us. But we don't hear or see because we really like it the way it is. We just want to be delivered from the bad part. And we want to hold on to the good part. That's who we are. We need to know who we are without condemnation. We need to know who we are. Right? So, if you are if you are really desiring truth, and it's Christ in you, especially if it's Christ in you, desiring truth, you can take it from any source because spiritual truth is spread everywhere in this earth, other than in Satanism, which has everything backwards, and we were wonderful with that. And those are evil powers. So Gilgamesh has really touched my soul. Gilgamesh was written. Um, Gilgamesh was was uh, was a king in Sumeria, one of the cities in Sumeria, which Sumeria appeared right after the flood. No one knows where it came from. It just appeared. In other words, the garden changed. Adam's mind changed. And the environment changed. Adam descended in a spiritual dimension, and that descent of his mind completely changed the environment that he was living in, that he existed in. And Sumeria appeared, consisting of cities and people that I think look like us, although there were some images of reptilians there. But there was a people that looked like us in Sumeria. And apparently there were some sentient beings that looked like reptilians in Sumeria. That if they're around, we don't see them anymore. And that's another story. So Adam's mind 
literally creates the environment. So in Gilgamesh, the thing, he was a king, and he was a king that was part God. And then there was a, the citizens of his city, the citizens of his city, that were not gods. They were the people that were just humans. I'll say homo sapiens so that you can follow what I'm saying. So there was a god race on the earth, and there was a population of humans on the earth. Very interesting. In Gilgamesh, one of the one of the, the the things that the poem says about him, which makes him look very bad, sounds very bad, is that he was the first one to have sex with any virgin that was getting married. He had access to her before her husband, and of course that makes him sound very bad in the poem. But he was part god. His mother was God. How can his mother be a God? How can he be part God? Well, how could you be a son of God? How could you be a son of God? You know, I had a Jew ask me that. I live on Long Island. What actually gave me a reason to go into Manhattan, this was years ago. And I got it off of the train. And there was another ministry that was ministering on the street corner, and the Jewish man was arguing with him. How could God have a son? And the Lord gave me the answer for him. He actually put me on a train and sent me into Manhattan to answer this man. How could God have a son? How could Gilgamesh be the son of a God? So we have the son of a God being the first one to have sex with someone who's strictly human. Well, the New Testament says that Adam is the son of God. I can't find that in the Old Testament. The New Testament says Adam is the son of God. Gilgamesh was the son of a god. And he was the first one to have sex with a human woman. Now, get your mind out of get your mind out of the gutter. Okay. I don't mean to insult you by saying that. Get your mind out of this world. Okay. Maybe Gilgamesh was part God, imparted something to the lady that continued the race. Yeah. Maybe that's even a parable that's implying that the connection that Gilgamesh had with his mother, who was a god, was now imparted to, the, to his people, to the citizens of his city, so that they could prosper and live through a mediator, a mediator. I read that word somewhere, a mediator. Gilgamesh was a mediator. Hmm, isn't that interesting? How were the giants sons of giants? And how was Gilgamesh a son of, of uh, a son of Inanna? But the thing is, he was the son of the goddess. Who was the goddess? He was the son of the, the female side of the creation, of the female side of the female that exalted herself by acquiring the strength of her husband who she put under her feet. So we see that humanity has the ability to receive spiritual power from a source that's higher than we have within ourselves. It's, it's, it's actually, it's in the Bible, if you're willing to see it. I've been seeing several verses to me that indicate clearly reincarnation in the scripture. And you cannot talk to a strong Christian about reincarnation. I had one man in mind, I love him dearly. I tried to talk to him about it once he just wouldn't hear what I had to say. In the book of Hebrews, many chose to die a painful death in the hope of a better resurrection. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? 
It's right there in the book of Hebrews, you see. And there's a higher soul in us that recreates. There's a higher soul. A higher soul that recreates. And that higher soul is the spirit of the sun. And now we're talking about Israel. Okay, that was the, the book of Hebrews is talking about Israel. Israel had the spirit of the sun. And the spirit of the sun is a higher soul. The spirit of the sun. The son of God. The son of God is Cain and Abel. Joined to Elohim. God. Elohim is God. Okay. In spiritual things, the, the, the son of a spirit is attached to that spirit. Well, that that spirit is is um, is revealed through the sun that it brings into existence. In this world, we have a child we cut the umbilical cord. They grow up and they leave us. But that's the not only it's the exact opposite. This is a fallen world. In the spiritual world, when a spirit has a son, they become one. See, and the son is the outside, and the spirit is on the inside. So the way Gilgamesh became the son of God, the way that that the, the giants okay, became the sons of the giants, is that there was an interaction, the type of which is human sexual intercourse, but it's a spiritual intercourse, which results in the merging of the soul. The spirit has unifies with the soul. And they become something new. They become a new creature. And the new creature stays inside of this old person. And you become a son of God. See? The spirit of God enters in through your mind, through understanding. And interacts with your soul, and something is born in you, and that which is born in you is called the Son of Man. But that which entered into you, that had an intimate relation, an intimate spiritual relation with you, is the Son of God, who is a spiritual being that we know is. The ancient of days, well, it's not really the ancient of days, but that's the best example I can give you on the scripture. Mm -hmm. The first stream of life that entered into the empty space became the Son of God. Because to be a son, you have to be born. So that spirit that entered into the empty space brought into existence a race of animals that were formed from the ground. And then he took the dust to the ground and breathed the breath of life into it and made that interaction of it breathed the breath of life into the dust, okay? And, and created a conscious being, a mediator, okay? Between his breath and, and the dust became a mediator between God, which is pure spirit, and the ground, which is an ant, which is a conscious, sentient, thinking, Animal. Abel's the mediator. In this dispensation, his name is Christ Jesus. He's the mediator. God wants an intimate, spiritual, and soul relationship with us. But he will only interact with us through a mediator. And that's what Jesus is all about. The restoration of the mediator. But that's what it, that's what the sin of the giants were. There was an interaction between a spiritual being, a conscious spiritual being, and a, a visible race with a physical, I don't know. And that, I'm going to say physical so that we can understand. 
and the son that was born of the spiritual being that was pure spirit and the physical being that was from the earth, earthy, is a, is a spiritual being that's inside of the physical being. And when that son is born in you, the spirit that, that interacted with you to bring him into existence is there also. And you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to the spirit and the son that you gave birth to. And you're a whole new creature. And everything changes. Now, the church of Jesus Christ has existed for 2,000 years. More than 2,000 years. But we're in a very, a very, 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 very basic form. Most likely because the people don't understand who or what we are. But even more so, but even more so, because it's taking this long for the spirit of Jesus Christ, because it's not Jesus, he's not Jesus of Nazareth anymore. Please, brethren, stop praying in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't exist anymore. Jesus of Nazareth married the soul of Messiah, and they became a new creature. His name is Jesus, not Jesus of Nazareth. And he's now the name of God. He married God, and he became God's name. And because he became God's name, he became a mediator between, he became, he became the Son of God. The Son of God was born inside the body of Jesus of Nazareth. And the body of Jesus of Nazareth died, but the, the, but the Son that was born from the interaction of God and the, the, the soul that was in Jesus, survived. But today he has no body. He's the son of God, but he has no body. So that's why the scripture says in the New Testament that Adam is the son of God. But it doesn't say in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, Adam was not born. He was, he was not a son. It was a creation. But he had not been born yet. But in the New Testament, Adam, the Son of God, it says Adam, the Son of God. Because the New Testament was written after Jesus' resurrection, and it was actually able with the Jesus that was resurrected. So, so that's how you become a son of, of, of a spirit. You have to have a female host. Have to have a female, the stories of a female host. So, so on the other side of the flood, what we had were at least two races of beings, if that's the even the right word. We had a race of spirits, beings that were all spirit. And then a race of physical bodies. And, I mean, who knows, there's all kinds of stories about the spiritual races. We read about them in Greek, you know, Greek mythology and Roman mythology. The same gods from of Greece and Rome, they just took different names. Where are they all? Well, they're, in a, they're behind the wall. They're on, they're on the other side of the Great Gulf. We've been separated because they rebelled against God. And they were marrying the human beings and producing offspring. And they were called giants. The spiritual beings are called giants. You couldn't see them, but the sons of the giants, you can see. They acquired a body. 
the spiritual beings that came into existence when the creation began. That, that stream of light that entered into an empty space started to reproduce itself. And, and the, the spiritual beings that emanated from it at some point rebelled against the source and acquired for themselves many human beings. They took many wives of the, of the animal race as they chose. So right now they're possessing the whole human race. But I, need, I need to qualify that. I need to qualify that. They're not possessing the whole human race. God separated them. That's what the flood was about. That's what the flood was about. They were destroying human beings that they were living through. They were destroying the creation. Our example is Balaam beating his ass. So the flood separated us. And a whole human race existed as the, the garden transformed to the garden transform instantly. I don't know. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. It was in a much higher dimension than we have now. Maybe it did transform instantly. I don't know. But when Adam descended in his mind, the whole environment transformed. And they were a race of human beings okay, that were not spiritual, that were born and died. And there was a race, if that's the right word, of gods, okay, or there was a pantheon of gods okay, that wanted human form. And the way they take human form uh, is to interact with the mind, with the mind and spirit of the humans and birth their offspring in the humans, and then they get inside of the human. And you may recall from Gilgamesh's poem, from the poem of Gilgamesh, that Inanna wanted to marry him, and he refused. He refused. He was already, he was already, this is really interesting, he was already a son, he was already part God, okay? This is really interesting. Well, he was already part God, so why would he refuse to marry Inanna? What's going on here? Well, he had what some of us have, or what's being developed in us right now. In order for a spirit to marry you and produce a child in you, you have to be of the animal race, say the human race, okay, of the, of the, the animals that were made from the ground. You have to have something in you that can receive the seed of God. So what Gilgamesh had is what some of us here had. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Something in them, and there was something in Gilgamesh that could receive the seed. There was, uh, there was Jesus called it uh, the good ground. He called it the good ground. Not this. Like this, okay. but a soul, okay, a soul that was ground that the seed could root in. So Gilgamesh had had a soul, okay, that was higher than the soul of the body. There, was, there were five grades of soul. Three grades of soul that are available to human beings. Personality is the first grade of soul, and that's king. Our spirit is the second grade of soul, and that's evil. Then there's a third grade of soul that comes from the, 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 the spirit of God. All mixed with the earth in different dimensions. So it's that spiritual, intellectual soul that can hold on to the sea. It can actually birth the sun. So we see the sun 
grows out of the interaction of the intellect and spirit and the spirit. And what brings them together is the spiritual knowledge that the spirit feeds to the intellectual soul. The son, the son of the God, because these spiritual beings are gods, they're lesser gods. Job is the greatest of all the gods. All of these spiritual beings are gods. The scripture says, Jehovah says in the scripture to Israel, uh, you, you, you are gods, but you will die like men. But you died like men. What does that mean? It means that there were two sides to them. It meant that they were animals like we are, and that the Son of God was born in Israel. When Israel was supernatural, the Son of God was born in them. But they chose to live out of their humanity rather than out of their spiritual intellect. And their spiritual intellect died. And then when the spiritual intellect died, they died physically also. So we see that to be a spiritual son, but to be a spiritual son, as a man, is, is something that emerges out of the human intellect. Or I don't know if it's the human intellect, I don't know if that's correct. It's something that emerges out of intellect. Listen. To become a son is a mind. A son is a mind. It emerges out of intellect. So the church today, brethren, is not not much in the church. Not many. I don't know everybody, but not many are pursuing after intellectual studies. They are chasing after the spirit that makes their emotions feel good. But your, that spirit cannot keep your body alive. So the issue of the day is the length of life of the body. The core of this whole message that I'm trying to get to today is the preservation of the body. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have the you have a relationship with him through the word of God. I've been here before. You have a relationship with him through the word of God. When you, when you read the word of God and you believe it and you seek the God of the Bible, he gives you, that's a covenant, and he gives you the spirit of his son. And if you follow after that spirit rather than your own mind, Paul tells us in the book of Romans, you are a son of God. There are different degrees of sons. Okay. You have the, 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 the foundation of his son in you, the very foundation. But that is just the beginning. Okay. What, why don't these people that have the spirit, they follow to the, the spirit of God, they die. But, but then if you, were, if you were a full-blown son of God, your body would not die. God wants to, prison, God wants to complete his work in us. He wants our bodies to stop dying. He wants us to give up the fantasy of, of dying and going to heaven. What an abominable lie. Listen, there is a son of God. His name is Primordial Adam. He is not called a son in the early scripture because he's not born yet, but the seed of the son, okay? The life of God entered into this world with instructions to, to reproduce himself. And in order to reproduce himself, he had to create a human race that would be the female, uh, the female ground that would receive the seed. So this Elohim that we read about in Genesis 1, well, first of all, they're plural. Um, if you've been around for a while, you should know that Elohim is plural. There's a whole race of spiritual beings that are pure spirit that created uh, this environment and that created humanity in whatever form he was in uh, before the fall. Created a female race for them to join with and produce a mediator that would abide forever inside of the created race that would keep them together forever. The spirit and the created race 
would create a new creature that would abide within the created race. And the created race was intended to prosper and be happy and have all their needs met. And the race of spirits, of spiritual beings called Elohim, were to have uh, the experiences of being, uh, of, the, of the use of this world. So that race of spiritual beings, okay, collectively, Elohim, is called the spirit of Messiah. If that spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. So what? Quicken means to make alive. That means you don't die. Quicken means to make alive. That means that you don't die. So why does everybody die? Because that's not the spirit that's in you. Because that's not the spirit that returned on Pentecost. It's a different spirit. And there's only one God and only one spirit of God with different functions, different manifestations of that spirit, different administrations of that spirit, Paul says. The spirit that returned on Pentecost was the, the spirit of God that was specifically designed in, a, in its particular function of the spirit of God. It was particularly designed to begin the process of the unification or the reunification of, of God, of which is purely spirit and humanity. The spirit came to us in a form that we could possibly receive, which means it came to us in a very, 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 very basic form that made us feel good because we were emotional creatures and before the spirit touches us, everything is emotions. Anybody, everybody knows that children that are hungry don't learn. Everyone that's had children know that children that are hungry don't learn. As far as I'm concerned, adults that are hungry don't learn. All that you can think about is getting food. Out in the rain and the snow and the elements and you don't have a home, are you going to sit down and engage in an intellectual interaction with the spirit? No, all you want is the needs of this body to be met. What the needs of your body met? Once the needs of your body are met, then some people move on to spiritual, to intellectual development. Well, I think most do, actually, but not everybody. If not, intellectual development, uh, I, I, didn't, I don't necessarily mean academia. If you want to learn to be a mechanic, or an artist, you become creative. And whichever direction you go in, you go beyond um, the animal life, because the animal life is continuously seeking food and shelter and reproducing itself. That's the animal life. So once, once, once the humanity uh, has those needs met, they start seeking the spiritual life because there's the breath of Jehovah in us. So the Holy Spirit that came on Pentecost came in a form that was designed for a specific function to be received by uh, the church. And it came in a form that stimulated the emotions. The scripture says we received the spirit in our heart. It came to the emotional beast. It came to heal our emotions. And all of the problems that emerge out of either unmet emotion, emotional needs or, or, or corrupted emotional needs. Yes. In, in its, in its, well, we have a Bible here on Long Island, and while back, there was a lot of healing to the physical body. People got up in wheelchairs. Uh, that did happen. And that was an emotional thing, if you can hear it. 
you can hear it, that it's satisfied the emotions that their body should be healed. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit came to satisfy emotional needs and physical needs. And it came with the Word of God. It did come with the Word of God. And there was some intellectual study that came with it, but it only went so far. Because the depth of intellectual, of the depth of spiritual intellectual study is in the Son of God, not in the Spirit. In the Son of God. The Son of God is a spiritual plant. It roots down in your soul. And the place that it roots is in evil. The spiritual intellectual soul is able. And he's buried down in decaying. And in, at least here on Long Island, in most of the churches that I see, the emotionalism of the Holy Spirit is sought above and beyond the intellectual curiosity, the spiritual intellectual curiosity of Abel. And this is the message, this is the message of the hour. Jesus is about to return in a powerful way that the majority of believers are not ready for. If only I had a better understanding of how it's going to happen, I don't know. But this is what I do understand. That when Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit, when he offered us that degree of salvation, the salvation comes in degrees. Our spirit is saved through union with the Spirit of God. So when it enters into our emotions, our emotions are spiritual. The Holy Spirit entering into our life, okay, unifies with our spirit. That's the second grade of soul. And our spirit is in Abel, Abel who is buried unto Cain. So the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And has to penetrate Cain. Years ago, I used to call her a chastity belt. She's lying over Abel. So the, the Holy Spirit enters into our life and has to penetrate Cain to touch Abel. He has to wake up. He has to wake up before he stands up. He has to stand up. When he stands up, he stands up above Cain. Cain is on the circle of the earth. When Abel stands up, they become perpendicular to each other. And Jesus is right here in the corner. God has an agenda. And he has a string. He did not give us his Holy Spirit without a string. He's not Santa Claus. God is not Santa Claus. Jesus is not Santa Claus. He wants something back from us. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. That means they're free. Okay. So that we can become prepared to marry him. But the marriage is spiritually intellectual. The marriage is not to our spirit. The marriage is to our spiritual intellect. The marriage is to Abel. So before we can, we can marry us, Abel must be liberated from the chains that Cain has on him. After Abel to be liberated, Cain has to be overcome. Our own, our own nature, our own will has to be overcome and subsumed to the authority and the will of Abel. Everything that we want is not necessarily bad, but it may not fit the agenda of God well, it may not fit the agenda of the bridegroom whose name is Jesus. Jesus is coming to marry Christ Jesus in us. Abel must rise above Cain, must become the ruler or the master of our person, in which we're, we're not a singularity. We are Cain and Abel. And the breath of Jehovah is really only two because the breath of Jehovah goes both ways. The breath of Jehovah is in Cain 
and the breath of Jehovah is able. So that's the fallacy of the that's the, the mess up of the Trinity. There's only two. The, the breath goes in different ways in both sides. Abel, the, the only way Abel can stand up is by the power of Christ. The Holy Spirit communicates with him and can wake him up. And in order for him to stand up, we need Christ, which is the blood of Jesus, which is the seed of the son, the seed of the plant. Okay. The seed has to get buried in Abel. And then Abel stands up and unifies with the seed, Christ, and becomes Christ Jesus, the bright, the bride. Jesus wants to marry us. And before he can marry us, Christ Jesus has to be formed in us, and Christ Jesus is intellectual. Christ Jesus is your spiritual, intellectual soul. He, he's the restored mediator. He, he's the whole Adam. Male and female, Cain and Abel, with Jehovah's, Jehovah's breath in the right moral order. He's the seed that's planted, and Abel is the good ground. So when we come to the parable of the soils, some seeds fall on the wayside. People don't even hear it. Some fall in stony places. Stony places are the intellect where there's not much earth. And they fall on Cain, and Cain likes it, but never breaks through the, in the millstone dream, it's called the, the mantle or the matrix. It has to break, it has to break through the ground which is Cain is the ground, has to break through the ground and get to Abel. And then when the plant sprouts in Abel, it sprouts through the ground and he stands up. Christ is the seed that gets buried in Abel's ground. Then the seed sprouts and that's how he gets on top of Cain and takes authority over her. And when you put Cain and Abel together in the right moral order, you have Christ Jesus, or, or Adam, or the whole Adam. And Elohim, in the, in the name of Jesus, comes down and marries Christ Jesus. And the Son of Man, the Son of God, comes down and marries Christ Jesus, and he is born again as whole Adam the ruler and the master of all of humanity and all creation. And we are a part of him, but we are not him. We are a part of him. So Jesus wants his bride, and he's waited 2,000 years. He's waited, well, he's, he's beyond time, but this is just a parable. He's not going to wait any longer. He's coming. And he, he owns all of us. And his ownership, his ownership is intellectual. He wants to talk to us. That's what I said an hour, two hours ago. That was what I told you two hours ago. That when I first heard that, I thought it was crazy. That God, who can have, do anything, have anything, wants someone to talk to. He wants someone that reflects his image so that they can have an intelligent conversation. And we're it, except that we're not talking to him. In most instances, in most instances, the people who oh are God, because it's happening first with the church. He owns all of humanity, but it's starting with the church. We want to bring Jesus down to our level. We want him to fix it down here. We want him to come here and fix it here. Bring people into the church. Bring miracles into the church. Bring the drug addicts and the alcoholics into the church and let them be healed and be in the church. And let the services remain the same. But, that's, but God wants more than that. He wants to birth his son in us, and then he wants us to go. Don't misunderstand me. I think 
personally, I think they will always be churches because we're supposed to fellowship together, but they'll probably be different than what the church is today. But that's not my issue here. What he wants is a personal union with you where you go everything, everywhere together. You know, the example, that, this is the example that I perceived yesterday uh, that I'll share with you because it's really hard to explain. There's a big difference between having a life out there and going to church. And where I was raised up in a church where I was there five nights a week. It was my whole life. Okay. Spiritually speaking and emotionally speaking, it was my whole life. But but I had a job, I had a home, I had a child. Okay. He wants to be with you 24-7. He wants to be with you, talking to you, having access to you 24-7. That means everything that you do, okay, is him doing it through you and with you. Now, how can that be? How could you have a job and concentrate on something else? The world is changing. I don't know. Well, I know how to explain it to you in terms of ministry. I don't have a secular job. Well, I don't have a secular job, but I still have to take care of the things in this world, which is a great frustration to me because I'm, I'm a spiritual hog. I want to be talking to him continuously. But I I have a lot of help. I told you there's someone that cleans my house. There's a handyman now that fixes things, but I have to supervise them. I have to tell them what to do. I have to met, meet with Susan and manage the ministry. Uh, I would like to just uh, be a prophet of God and just do whatever he wants me to do. I still have things to do in this world. But you all that have secular jobs and families, you, just, you need to understand how severely limited you are. And many of you understand how severely limited you are because you would like more with him, but he has not provided an income for you. That, that's the best that I can tell you that he wants that, that marriage to go. And I haven't experienced the whole thing yet. Marriage to God, which is the next stage of our development. I mentioned two hours ago, Jesus gave us a parable. The first, the blade, okay, that's the Holy Spirit, has appeared in the earth. Then the ear, which when you look it up, it means the head, that's Jesus that came forth. A, 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 a perfect man, but no body yet, no physical body yet, but he's in perfection and can never die again. That's the head, that's the ear, okay. We're in the third stage now, the full ear in the corn. That means what happened to Jesus is spreading into us, okay? And he wants the fullness with, the, with his people and eventually with all human beings. Now, not everybody can abide hours and hours with God. You couldn't, you couldn't bear it. Christ in you has to be built up to the point that you can bear this, the intensity of this relationship. But the things happen to you when you're in, in, in that degree of communion with God, the world out there becomes your, becomes your enemy and attacks you. We have much to learn. I've learned so much over these years, but God only knows what I don't know. I, I was thinking about this the other day, how much God has taught me about people, about his people, about myself, about how, how, how to live, about how to relate, to, how to deal with issues. Uh, so much, so much. I've learned so much. It's just amazing what he's taught me. But the day is coming, brethren, in the next age. This in, what is the next age? This environment, the world as we know it will no longer look like this in the next age. How rapidly will the transition take place? It's probably different for everybody, I, I don't know. But the world will not look like this. People will not look like this. Okay. Although there will probably be homo sapiens on the earth as well as the new, listen, the new race that's coming into existence and it's a God race. And we read about it in the book of Acts, it's a new race coming into existence, the new giants. Now, you hear someone 
like Steve Quayle talking about the giants coming back, and he's talking about all the bad giants. Well, the bad giants are coming back, but what about the good giants that are coming back? The good giants are coming back. The full manifestation, the third stage, the full ear in the corn, the full stage, the fullness, the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ manifested through human flesh. The, gi the good giant, there's a race of giants that's about to appear on the earth. Now, I don't really see our physical stamina station changing, changing because how will we relate to other people, at least not at this time. But we will be spiritual giants doing good. Jesus and Nazareth went about doing good. But we will be doing more than healing people. People need to be prepared to receive the Lord as their, as their, their bridegroom. He intends to marry all of us. We don't even have, a, I don't even have a clue of the greatness that's coming to this earth. But the church is not prepared to receive him. Because I, I don't know that this message actually has been ever preached before. Not, not that I know of. And only who knows how many believe it. Even the members here, you may think you believe it. You don't really know. You don't really know that you believe it until you test it, right? I don't know that I believe it until I'm tested. I don't know. But he's ready. He wants his bride, you see. So he's about to break forth on the church. And I don't know if it's just the church or all of humanity. I, I, I don't know. He's about to break forth. He's about to break forth because he wants his wife. And however this is going to work, is going to open people. Listen, brethren. The only, listen, there's no easy way to tell you this. Now you need to get a grip on yourself, okay? You're okay. You're okay and everything's okay and Jesus loves you, but this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. You're about to be penetrated. Your mind is about to be penetrated by the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought you said that we needed to be prepared. What's coming is his seed. You've just received the Holy Spirit. I know at one point of people, within the last couple of months, I was saying if you received the Holy Spirit, the seed was with it because I was seeking for this truth, and that was what I thought for a season, but it's not true. It's not true. The Holy Spirit did not carry the seed. The seed is coming through this message. So for the, the, for the people of God, it's going to start with the people of God. And I told you also two hours ago that he's raising up uh, men of God that, that perceive that I'm a woman of God but they're afraid of my message. They're afraid of it. They don't know what to make out of it. And they don't understand it because I'll send them a book. I mean, they didn't learn it from the beginning. I, I don't think I don't think that people are going to have to learn it from the beginning. I'm preaching for 35 years. Yeah. But basically it's the same message, just being presented in different and more mature ways. So somehow, there is a change coming to your capacity to understand. There is a change coming to your capacity to understand. There's a change coming to your mind. And that, that capacity is in the blood of Jesus, which is the seed that needs to get planted in Abel. Abel, that's down here. That cane is lying on top of. So, with it, I'm so immersed in the millstone dream, but you probably haven't even looked at it for weeks. So, to me, it is just so real. I'm still working on it. It's, it's just incredible what the word is showing. I'll remind you that at one point, that stone, which is the sea, okay, is coming from a very high place. And first, it crashes into the water, then it goes, it penetrates the, the, the ocean bed, 
Okay. And then it penetrates the the uh, the mantle. So I'm not sure if that's three penetrations or two. I'm not sure. I'm not really up to that part yet. I haven't gone into depth in that part yet. Penetrating the water, that's your soul. That's the Holy Spirit. Penetrated your soul, your, your emotion, penetrated into your emotions, and that was good. You love it, right? It wasn't painful. <laughs> that wasn't painful. That was a wonderful uh, penetration. Right? But next, it has to penetrate the ocean bed, and the ocean bed is pain, and that hurts. It, it's 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 like the consummation of of, of, of a virgin having sex for the first time. There's no way for it to happen without some painful experiences. So many in the church have already had painful experiences. But something has to break in you. Cain, Cain has to break in you. Trials and tribulations and trials and tribulations and trials and tribulations and trials and tribulations have you given over your whole life to God? Well, I think I have, but I'm not sure, but I really can't. It has to break. It has to break. And trials and tribulations are the only way to do it. So there's judgment coming. You see. But you need to know that you're not to be afraid of anything that you will come up on the other side, that Jesus is Lord, and then what's happening is that the virginity of your mind is being penetrated. However, you experience it, I, I don't know. But there's no way without that breaking. There's no way. For him to reach Cain and to reach Abel that's under you, to birth his son in you. Well, I hear from him now. Well, we hear from Abel under the ground, but the son hasn't been born in you. Abel has to be born again in you. The, the creation, which is Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel right now, Cain and Abel, okay, has to be born again. Jesus, uh, Abel, Abel is good ground. Okay, but his seed is dead. He was cut off from Elohim. So this seed is coming to the people of God, to the people that already have a relationship with him. The seed is coming, and it's going to have to break through your maidenhead to get to the ground because it has to be born because the Lord Jesus Christ has to marry you to save your body. So I started to touch on that, and I didn't get very far with it. There were degrees of salvation. So if, you, if your spirit is connected with Jesus, your spirit is saved. That means when your body dies, your spirit goes back to God. Then there's the salvation of, of, of the soul, which is your personality. And that I taught a lot on, that your soul can be saved. But it's, what it looks at me, your soul can be saved from a of disintegrating into nothing. The death of the personality, the death of the soul, which is the personality, okay, that is the clay that we read about in Jeremiah, of break it up and reform it, okay. It, it, it just goes back to seed, so to speak. That salvation, okay, when, when your soul, okay, cleaves enough to the, to the life of God, and your body dies, it's possible, it's possible for your soul to not die. But if it doesn't die, whether this is a mature message, listen, listen to me. If your body dies, but your soul doesn't die, okay, your soul, a soul cannot live without a body. It doesn't fly to heaven, it's alive. Your personality cannot live without a body. So either it dies with your body and it goes back to dust, or it separates from your body, which goes back to dust, and it is joined to another like soul, another soul that's like it. 
what, what do you mean like it? That's like it with regard to its relationship with Jesus. It can be joined to any other soul that's in a believer that's in a similar degree of maturity to the one that your soul had with Jesus. And when that happens, the soul that's separated from the body that died, okay, that is joined to the soul of a like soul in another believer, loses its identity. Its substance is saved and it becomes an enhancement to the believer that it is joined to. And it loses its name because your body is the name of your personality. Your body is the name of your personality. If your personality survives the death of your body, it loses its name. And it becomes a part of another name. And that doesn't happen very often, in my, my understanding. That's not happening very often these days. That most believers do not develop that degree of intensity of a relationship with the Lord Jesus, that when their body dies, uh, it goes to a like soul. And of course, part of the problem is they may not even be a like soul available. But we're now up to the preservation of the body. The age to come, and the age to come, the body will have the opportunity to live up to a thousand years again. We're going back, we're going back to the uh, to life, the way life was when, when humanity was closer to God. We're being drawn back closer to God. There's absolutely no scriptural foundation to go, go to heaven and, and then who knows what. No, no, we're going back to what we fell from. Intimacy with God. Complete intimacy with God. And and that that intimacy that existed in the early day should be completed with a body because they didn't have bodies at the beginning. So the whole thing is the whole thing is the development of a body, okay? the body with its personality that will be the wife of the life of God through a mediator called Abel, the dust within the body. It, it has not happened yet. It has not happened yet. The creation in this dimension was never completed. I hope that's true. Well, not with the body in this form. It, it, was, it was never completed because, because if the creation had been fully completed on the other side of the flood, it could have never, it could have never, um, it could have never fallen. There was some, some degree of it because there were sons of God. There was a race of, of intelligent animals that had the that had the, the, the offspring of God in them, and therefore through that offspring had a relationship mm. with the gods, you know. But it was never fully, but then the gods turned evil. And then the gods turned evil and abused the bodies, or the, the gods, which were the, spirit, the, spirit, the, the spiritual race, okay, the Elohim, were overtaken by the pleasures of the body. And as, listen, as soon as you prefer the body to the pleasure that comes from God, you're dead. So let me say this again. A pure spirit, okay? We talked about the incarnation of the primordial kings. We've talked about all of these things. A, a pure spirit that is, that is righteous, that is still in my standing with God, okay, that marries a human being, uh, that develops a relationship with a human being, a spiritual, intellectual relationship with a human being, but to the intent of producing uh, uh, a son, a spiritual son in the human being, 
who becomes the mediator between the human being and God, so that all dwell together in one shell, which is the human being. There is a point at which that becomes permanent and God is all in all. God enters into that vessel, which is already a human being, a spirit, and the offspring of that spirit, and God, the creator, enters in also. That's him being all in all. We read about that in Corinthians. And, and that's the end. That has only happened in Jesus of Nazareth, and he doesn't have a body, so it's not even complete in him. You can understand what I'm saying. Understand what I'm saying. Go ahead. We're up to the preservation of the body. That's what's coming. We read in the scripture, a body thou hast prepared for me. The issue is the body. All the aliens want a body. All the Christians are ready to give up their body and go fly away to heaven. The issue is your body. They want your body. And Jesus wants your body. And now that this message is being preached in understandable English, whether you understand me or not, it's being preached in English. And it's possible for, for human beings to understand this message. Now that this is happening, he is coming and he's going to break forth upon many in a way that may not be pleasant. But you need to know you will come up on the other side and that he loves you and everything's okay. Don't lose your faith. It's a great message. He's coming with judgment. That's what the scripture says. He's coming with judgment. And that judgment is designed to break Cain. And the overriding, overriding characteristic of Cain is pride. He's coming to break your pride and your will. Because he has to be the boss. He has to be the head of the whole household. It cannot be any other way. We've had 2,000, more than 2,000 years to produce the message in a, not only in, an un, in a human language, but it's written down, books and, and electronic messages. And it's already started to go forth to others and root in others. Now he's coming back soon. He's coming with judgment. And it will be more difficult for some than for others. But the end of the whole thing is his full possession of us. I wanted to share with you what I perceived yesterday. That it used to be that preaching, you know, I preach twice a week on Thursday and Sunday. Preaching used to ground me. In other words, when when you don't have a secular job and you have a spiritual person, uh, life life can, can can become very interesting. You just float away. You know, in the middle of anything, I start thinking spiritual thoughts. And you just you just you just I don't know how, how to explain it to you. you. Just it's 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 very hard to stay focused. You know. If you're at that degree of maturity, you just keep getting drawn into the spirit. You need something to root you here, like the Kabbalists will tell you. Uh, you if you're a man, you're, well, usually with the Jews anyway, you're a man. You need to get married. You need a wife and a family. You need to you need to celebrate the Sabbath. You need to be home with your family on Friday. You need to have sex with your wife on Friday. You need to talk to your kids. Otherwise, you're just too spiritual. You're just going to float away. It's just, it's just not, it's not healthy for us in this stage of our existence. That, that's what the Orthodox Bibles believe, as far as I understand it. Well, preaching here grounded me. I get days mixed up. I, I have a calendar. I have clocks and calendars all over the house. Susan's laughing. And all over the house, I get the days mixed up. I get the weeks mixed mixed up. Uh, I order things twice, and Susan has to send them back. You know, I mean, crazy things happen 
in my life that destabilized me. Well, listen, brother, I've been made, made no secret of it that my, um, my my health, my body is compromised. Well, I have to do all these things to take care of myself. And one of the things I do is that I squeeze carrot juice, I eat carrot juice every day. There's a whole big ritual that I go through. I get carrots and spinach, and I put this drop in and that drop in this year. I take all kinds of stuff. I don't like it. It's a dependency, but that's what I have to do. Well, right in the midst of this week where I was really, really not, I mean, there was really something wrong with me, okay, uh, my juicer breaks. My juicer breaks. And it really is a crisis for me because God is keeping me alive with all of this stuff, you yeah. uh, know. So I tried eight, at least eight times in three different outlets and it didn't work, so I knew that I had to get another juicer. It's it's really it's really important. I'm rather I'm compromised. I'm immune compromised. There's no question about it. I'm I'm flying on air, and the air is the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I've told you that before. So I who knows what I did? I ordered it twice. You know? so then of course the next day it started working. So now I have two. I now have three juices. <laughs> two still in the box. Mm-hmm. All kinds of things happen. You know, I I just I I learn to I do the best I can to take as much precaution as I can because bizarre things happen. Mm-hmm. Was it was a year ago or two years ago, a closet door my my closed closet door in the living room jammed and I couldn't open it. You know, so I had to get a, a handyman. It was on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. It was my neighbor. I was so glad he was there. It took him. I think three hours to get that. Now, this is a man that is a handyman that does it for a living. It took him three hours to get the door open of my clothes closet in my living room. I took pictures of him. First, he tried to take the hinges off. He tried all different things. It took him three hours to get the door open. Bizarre things happened to me. Yeah. The other day, I was locked out of my bedroom. How did the door get? I I don't know. I almost never close the door from the outside of my of my room, but I, that day I didn't make the bed and I didn't want anyone looking into my room, so I closed the door and the, the button was pressed and I got locked out of my bedroom. It's crazy things happen. It's crazy, crazy, bizarre things happen. So I need to know that I have to be here, okay? On Sundays and Thursdays, I need to be here. And that was what grounded me. But this lately, and I don't know how long it's going on, I haven't felt that I'm supposed to be here. It hasn't been grounding me. I'm saying, I hope, I pray that I, I don't forget to go into the office to preach. You know? I, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be preaching tomorrow. So I asked the Lord about that last night because I said, Lord, what's going on in my life? All of these changes I told you at the beginning of this message. Something's really changing in me, right? and he's more powerful in me, and he's moving me in different directions. And if you have, if you're not really experiencing it, I don't know how to explain it to you. I just heard something about Daniel's seventieth week. Where did I hear that? Uh, somebody was preaching it, and in my opinion, the church tradition of that message of Daniel's seventieth week is incorrect. So I just felt to take a look at what I had said about it because I had not, I was not able to get it back at that moment. So I wanted to review what the Lord had taught me on it. So I wound up looking at it. And then I came across another, I thought I came across a book by Bill Branham uh, that was talking about Daniel's 70th week. If that book exists, I have not been able to find it. What I found was a book by Bill Brannon that was talking about the, the seven churches. So either I looked at the book of the seven churches and it was overshadowed and thought it said Daniel's 70th week. When there was a book, Daniel's 70th week, that's in my house somewhere that I, by Bill Brannon that I cannot find. So now I follow, I follow the lead. Okay, I'm interested in Daniel's 70th week. That's how the Lord leads me. He doesn't he doesn't tell me intellectually. I just perceive that that's where he's going. That's where the spirit in me is going. 
and then made the personality. I followed him. So I look up to see what I already had on it, and it wound up. I wound up turning it into a short uh, book, a teaching, and it's going to be a book too. Okay. Uh, what am I trying to tell you? Is that that's my whole life, and then I get lost. I forget everything else that I'm doing, you know, and I get I get lost. You know? So I'm saying, what? Uh, I just didn't feel like I'm supposed to preach tomorrow. What's going on? Are you moving me in another direction? Maybe one day I won't show up. That would be terrible, you know? Uh, and what he told me, no, I'm not stopping preaching. You know? What he told me is that preaching here is no longer what is grounding me. If I'm making any sense at all. Being here twice a week is no longer what is grounding me which is a form of control that I shouldn't go rules like okay. that's no longer the this is no longer this obligation okay to be here twice a week is an obligation to God and to you is no longer the spiritual the driving force in my life that comes from God you know, from from this point of view of, of my life in this world that he's increased in me to a degree that he himself is now that driving force. And that's what I'm feeling. I feel like, I feel like I've been cut, cut loose. That he's, he is now at a degree of maturity in me and driving my life. And the example I gave you was this teaching on, on Daniel. It just came out of the blue. And there I am sitting there working on seeing the millstone dream, the millstone five unfinished books, yeah. and I'm um, doing this teaching on Daniel. Well, he wanted that teaching. He has now increased to a point that he's more powerful in my life than my commitment to God to teach here twice a week. Don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm going to continue to teach. But he's. Inc Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the strangest feeling that I don't feel that, that pull anymore. So th things are changing. That was the example that I wanted to, to give you, <laughs> that I'm that much more tied to him. And I believe that this will continue until he he has um, fully appeared in me. That's the right way to express what's happening. Because I don't really understand um, the process. No. Yes? Um, you, I have a question. You were said you were comparing it to the Jews and have, um, they need to come to home on, on mm -hmm. Friday or, or else they would spiritually fly away. So now what would be grounding you that you wouldn't spiritually fly away? <laughs> him. I have to trust him that I'm not going to fly away, whatever that means, you know. You get, um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the end of it could be, you know. I don't know what the end of it, is, but it's him. It's him inside of me, which is the ultimate, which is the ultimate goal for all of us. That he, we should be so full of him that the foundation is inside of us. That's the, well, we read about that, but we don't really experience it. At the foundation, we all know that he's the foundation, but we don't really understand that that we just have the beginning of him. That when, when he is fully your foundation, you do anything or go anywhere, and you're okay with it. And I have shared with you all how John Lake and Smith Wigglesworth, Wigglesworth have these testimonies. One of them bought a ticket to Africa, well, to, on a, to a boat to Africa with his last dollar. I mean, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I'm absolutely not ready for that. So I guess I've got a long way to go, you know. Uh, but that's what it will come to, that you'll be able to do anything and go anywhere with absolutely no doubt. You know, that's what I'm headed for. You know? But uh, I cannot even imagine doing something like that. But I'm excited about it. But he's coming back and he's coming He's, he's coming into the world, and he's coming with judgment. So, 
and that, that's my message now. I, I saw a movie that I think we're going to watch this movie. Um, for those of you that don't have the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I believe the Lord showed me this movie, and it is the answer. Uh, at least in, it is an answer as to why some of you are not experiencing that. And the answer is, is this, that the Holy Spirit is uh, connects with your emotions. And someone that is very strong, at that strength, can resist that connection. And that resistance is came in you. And that's what has to be broken. You can have an intense relationship with the Lord through the scripture, through your prayer life, through the esoteric message that I preach here. But you're not emotional. The Holy Spirit is emotional. Yeah. I mean, I, I told someone the other day, because I'm, I'm out of it now. I sit here and teach, but I was raised up in a Pentecostal church. I sang, I danced, I banged my tam tam tangerine, tangerine, tangerine. I got slain in the spirit. Everybody was laying all over the floor, casting out demons. You know? uh, and now that I'm so far removed from it, that when I see it, it really does look strange. And, and this movie that we're about to see, it's, a, it's an authentic experience of the deliverance ministry. Okay, Very authentic. And I was in that. And now looking at the movie, I'm saying, well, Lord, that, I, I know it's real, you see. That really must look bizarre to someone that's not in it. How? And that's the, that's the activity of the Holy Spirit. Abandonment of your emotions, moving, dancing, abandonment to the, to the move of the Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does to you. Some more than others, but that's what it, that's what the Holy Spirit revival is. People running around the church screaming and yelling. So if you're a person that is not very emotional, or that really restrains their, their themselves and has a lot of pride, it cannot penetrate you. It cannot penetrate you, but it needs to penetrate you. Because it's that power that penetrates Cain that gets the gets to Abel. So Abel and you have been awakened from this message. He hears, he's conscious, but he has to stand up above Cain. He has to stand up. Cain has to be overcome. And part of that overcoming is a degree of emotionalism. So if you're not an emotional person and you've gone up for prayer and you've never received the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. there's a good possibility that this is the answer why it hasn't happened for you. Now this movie is an incredible movie. It just really touched me and this is the core of it. It's about a man. The name of the movie is Saved Indeed. And indeed is two words. Saved indeed. It's about a man who was raised in the church, in the Pentecostal church. But a mild screaming, yelling at Pentecostal services. He acknowledges a minister, he lays hands on people, they get healed. He's a godly man. He's humbling himself before God. He has a his secular job is very humbling. He's he, he's a uh, a janitor. Yeah. And for the whole movie, I didn't get it. I didn't get it until the very end. He's worried. He's worried. Every day he's worried. And his mother keeps telling him, God has something for you. And he's just worried. And that's his life. He goes from being a janitor to the church and he lays hands on people. And then a woman comes into his life and he's tempted to fornicate with her. But this is just one of the things that happens to ministers in the church. She's a desperate woman with a child. He helps her, so she now she wants him, so he's tempted. All of this happens in the lives of ministers, all of these temptations. When you help desperate people, then they start to want you in a, in a human way, which is ungodly. He resisted, he succeeded, and he's just 
stressed through the whole movie. And the end of the movie is that a terrible tragedy happens. I'll let you watch the movie. A terrible tragedy happens. A bizarre tragedy happens. Bizarre. And he says, I just know I'm going to wind up in jail. From this thing. He's innocent. You know? I'm going to wind up in jail. And that was what did it. That he, 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 he wasn't saved indeed. He was saved, but he wasn't saved indeed. In other words, God had not penetrated him. God had not broken his maidenhead. He was doing everything he was taught to do in the church. But God had not touched him with that intimacy, which is the beginning of the greatest relationship you'll ever have in your entire life. So at the end of the movie, when he breaks, it's the end of the movie. I'm saying, it can't be the end of the movie. It can't be, don't, don't tell me he's going to jail. It can't be the end of the movie. So I'm going to show you this movie. I'm telling you it was absolutely authentic. I, I was raised up in that kind of atmosphere. And now this is how the Lord has taught me what I just told you, that those of you that have a great prayer life, that you hear the voice of the Lord, that he directs you, that you in the esoteric message, but you don't speak in tongues. He hasn't penetrated you. He hasn't penetrated Cain. He has not penetrated the maiden. And the only way for that to happen is that you get to the point that that, that you want desperate, that, that something has hurt you so badly and you have no power over it. So I was talking to one of the brethren here and they said, well, that's terrible. What's going to happen to me? And my answer is, my answer to that is, all things are possible with Christ. It's a portion in the Zohar. It's a portion in the Zohar. I couldn't find it. Uh, I don't even know how to search for it. When the rabbis uh, are, are saying, there's a rabbi that's crying all the time. And when he's asked, why are you crying? He says he's crying because of the truth. That he knows that a sinner that repents will go higher in God than he could ever go. A sinner that repents will go higher in God than he could ever go. So most of the people that come into Pentecost, that came into the Pentecost revival that did here, she was made that 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. A lot of drug addicts came in, a lot of alcoholics came in. I was physically dying, okay, and all messed up. Um, um, what brought me in problems in my life. And um, there, there were people, there were people in Pentecost that were raised in the church, that their lives were good, you know. But it seems to, I mean, I can witness to it being the people that are desperate, the people that are desperate for God get the breakthrough. I'll call it a breakthrough because they don't know what else to call it. But it's actually a breaking through of your, of your humanity. And God calls it, you know, piercing the, the, the matrix. And it's, it's a spiritual uh, a penetration uh, that's like into the wedding night. And he has to get to you, you know. Uh, so does something terrible have to happen to you? No. He, all things are possible with Christ Jesus. All things are possible in Christ. That's all that I can tell you. Okay. So with regard to the Jew, because the Zohar is written to the Jew, um, they know, they know that the, the sinner that repents and comes back to God has the goes higher than the person that's raised in, in the faith and does everything right. See, doing everything right is not enough to break the hard shell of your pride. Finding out, being confronted with something that's bigger than you are, you know, that you absolutely have no power over you. We must all find our powerlessness the point at which we break and submit to God. And that is an emotional breaking. When that happens, it will manifest itself emotionally. You know? um, I, I don't know how else to tell you, what else can I say to you? 
He said, please do not be discouraged and don't be afraid. Okay. But he has to break your pride. See? Because he fully intends to raise Abel from the dead in you. So he's talking, he's talking to Abel and you, he's teaching Abel and you. Abel's praying to him from under the ground. And Abel has to break that ground. He has to stand up. And when he stands up, it's an emotional experience. Yeah. So, so don't be upset, brother, but be brave, be strong, okay? And uh, have faith in God. Okay? He wants to fully marry you. He wants to give you a lot more than you have now. Yeah. So, are there any questions before we take a break in the morning? Um, no questions, but a couple of um, just a couple of comments. Rose said the movie is called Free Indeed. Oh, thank you, Rose. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, and then I think when you mentioned the philosopher earlier. Socrates. Yeah, I just looked it up. I just wanted, I think Socrates taught Plato and then Plato taught Aristotle. Oh, okay. So I, I just, that. yeah. Thank you. Glad to be great. Thank you very much. I had to look it up and so. And that's it. Okay. Let's just wait a minute. Maybe there's another question coming in here or something else the Lord wants to say. Right. Now, now, this movie, it doesn't mean that you have to become a wild person and scream and yell and wave your hands yet. It is an emotional breakthrough. And if you're naturally not emotional, don't, don't, don't get an idea in the head of what's going to happen. But that's the reason that if you've gone up for prayer and you never get it, that's the reason that you haven't, God hasn't broken you yet. You know? And that sounds like a terrible thing, but we have to all come to the end of ourselves. And that's what you're taught in the church. We have to come to the end of ourselves, that we're nothing without God, right? that we have no power over our own lives, and we're nothing without God. And then that that's that breaking produces that submission that eventually will birth his son in you. So depending on who you are and how rebellious you are, don't don't be afraid, okay? And uh, he loves you very much and he wants you all to be hearing if you got this form the message, he wants you to be a part of, of what's coming. What's coming on the other side of the judgment, whatever that, however that's going to manifest in the country and in the world. I hope you all know that the world is in crisis right now. Okay, and I can't go political now. That has to be a separate message. But we're approaching the crisis point, and either the the rulers of this world are going to implement. You see, there's a new a new system coming in, and either the rulers of this world are going to set in play their their new system, which is very bad for us. Mm -hmm. Or the the human beings that uh, that God is working with are going to put in another system that will carry us until the kingdom of God really fills the earth. So we're approaching that crisis point very rapidly. So the whole world is going under judgment, brother. It's not just, if you're sitting there in your home listening to me and, and biting your nails because you're wondering what God's going to do to you, the whole world is coming under judgment. You need, you need to know that, you know, that the whole world is in crisis. So don't be afraid, but have faith, okay? Have faith. Okay. So the name of the movie is? Rose just had a comment. Okay, you. sure. Um, I think she's still writing, but what she's written so far is it's very interesting what you're saying about breaking your pride if you're not an emotional person. When I was baptized in the Pentecostal church, I was not very emotional, but I was surrounded mm -hmm. by women who took me in the back room and they were very emotional. And I think that's what made me receive. So that makes total sense. Yes. Well, I was very emotional, you know, and now I'm not emotional like that anymore because it's a continuous growth process. That emotionalism in me is now uh, being converted into the emotionalism of God, 
which is compassion. I was, I was, did not have much compassion. I was a very selfish person. So it started out as, as emotionalism for me, but as I matured and as Christ is coming forth in me, I'm not emotional anymore, but, but, but the compassion of God mm-hmm. is growing in me, and it's the compassion of God that produces the miracle working power that you want to help people. You know? mm-hmm. So it's all part of the growth process. Mm-hmm. Don't think you're going to be a crazy person like that. But the bottom line is that you know, we have to break. Okay? Because you two cannot live together if you're going in, if you're unequally yoked. You both, we have to come into agreement with God's will. Okay? Otherwise, he, he's limited as to the degree that he can come into our lives. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, thanks for the correction on the name of the movie, Rose. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it so much that I expect to enjoy it again. And again, witnessing to the fact that it's a very authentic uh, uh, presentation. Of, that was what I grew up in, with Pentecostal church. Okay, God bless you all, brother. We'll just take a 10 minute break so that the media team can rest, unless they're ready to go forward with it. Uh, maybe you all need to rest your mind after a message like this. We'll wait 10 minutes and then we'll start the video. And then I'll probably speak it. God bless you.